Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing? Welcome to our fourth episode of Hutton's Consumer Connect webinar series. And thank you very much once again for being on time here with us. My name is PK So from Hutton's, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, we really appreciate that you take time out of your precious Saturday afternoon to be with us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me assure you that you know it will be all worth it because if you stay till the end with us, you'll be gaining so much insights that you could actually cut short your learning curve as you navigate the sea of property investment in Singapore. Now, in a short while, I'll be inviting our speaker online with us and to make sure that we keep to our schedule, uh, we'll open up for a few questions during the Q&A session towards the end. Okay, so in case we don't have the chance to answer some of your questions later on, please feel free to approach the Hutton's agent who has invited you today to attend this webinar. Um, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you the speaker for today, Ms. Alisa Ang. Now, after graduating from NUS with a Bachelor of Social Sciences with honors in Economics, Alisa worked as a research analyst with Franklin Templeton. She started her real estate career in 2007 and was consistently among the top 1% achievers in Hutton's before taking on the role of Director of Project Sales and Marketing last year. Lisa is also an established top speaker and trainer with a strong passion in the analysis of property market trends. And she's also a savvy investor herself, having started when she was 26, and she's currently rebuilding her own semi B. All right, so her topic this afternoon is top real estate mistakes you must avoid. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Miss Alisa Ng. Over to you, Alisa. Okay, hi everyone, and thanks so much, PK, for the wonderful intro. And a very good afternoon to all who are tuning in today. Uh, it's my honor to be able to share on the top real estate mistakes that you must avoid. Okay, give me a minute while I start my video. Okay, so can everyone see me and hear me loud and clear? Okay, I have lots to share, so without further ado, I'll dive right in. And a little bit on what I'll be touching on today, besides my main topic on identifying some top real estate mistakes that uh, in this line of 13 years, um, we have seen some of the very uh, commonly done um, mistakes in real estate. And uh, this is what I'm trying to navigate on and to identify on, those, on these mistakes that you must and should avoid. Okay, before I start on that, I'll be touching on some hot topics um, that I would like to address uh, before we go into the main topic. Okay, so let me go into the next slide. Okay, so take a minute to read through the disclaimer. Okay, basically it just uh, means to say that everybody has different opinions. Okay, what I'll be sharing today will be a lot of facts and stats and also some of my own personal opinions and advice. So um, we may have differing opinions, but I hope that by attending today's session, it will help you in making your real estate decision. Okay? Okay. Okay, I'll be sharing a few articles that um, I think there have been many, many articles uh, on uh, how COVID has impacted our property market, um, different uh, views and perspectives from different analysts, uh, you know. I will pick a few that I feel are more uh, interesting. And of course, any questions that you may have, you can post into the chat. We will look into it later. If not, you can also look for your Hutton's agent who has invited you today because we have many, many things to share about um, opportunities and you know, interesting facts uh, to know about um, in making a decision whether to buy now okay, or whether it's a good time to buy and what are the good buys in the market. Okay, so this article itself, Okay, I think it gives a very good insightful uh, brief on the cooling measures sparing our property market greater pain. Okay, take a look at some of the extracts from this article. Okay, okay this article itself actually lets us know that um, 
Previously, when we had a few uh, crises that we faced, the market then versus the market that we have now, okay, it's actually very different. If you take a look, there was actually a, a exuberance before the financial crisis. In other words, there was very, very high speculation. Okay, if you notice, uh, this is something very interesting. Within a span of two years period, from 05 to 07, prices actually risen by 49%. Okay, that was a very, very sharp increase. Okay, um, and this was due to the fact that was little deterrence against short-term speculation in real estate. Okay, so there were there were little uh, flood bar barriers. Okay, and this really caused a sh uh, speculation in the real estate that that um, which is why government came in. Okay, with cooling measures to stabilize the market. So, in other words, our market today, okay, is very grounded. There are very, very strong economic fundamentals and measures in place to really give better resilience to our real estate, Singapore real estate. And I think that is very, very uh, good and encouraging that our government has in fact made Singapore property, uh, even in a crisis like COVID-19, I would say one of the most attractive that you can see in the global market. Uh, that our real estate is still a very attractive asset despite any crisis it may face because of the resilience and the very strong economic fundamentals that we have in our uh, country. Okay, so take a look at the, um, some of the extracts here as well. Okay, from the end of 2011 to 2019, household net worth actually grew by 57% versus the value of homes that grew only 29%. Okay, so it was in stark contrast to the two-year 49% price increase. And over here, today, we're looking at a, over a span of eight years, it grew by just 29%. Okay, so in fact, another interesting thing to take note of is that total cash actually surged by 72% and CPF soared by 105%, with households saving much more than before. Okay, so this actually shows... Uh, an increased liquidity in the market, okay? Another perspective would be to see that without these cooling measures, okay, which stabilized the market, home prices would have easily been 18 to 22% higher than what it is right now, okay? So with this in mind, I'll move on to another inter interesting article. And I think this is something on people's mind because um, with COVID-19, people are thinking whether there will be uh, you know, distress sales, um, is that going to see uh, property transaction, transactions hitting new lows and what type of price adjustments or market expectations on the price that we may be having. So let's uh, take a look to explore a bit more into this. Okay, as you can see from this article from Business Times, um, with more, more mortgage listings going under the hammer, there are no distress sales as of now, okay, because banks are still holding back and giving borrowers more time. So there are some relief measures, okay? Uh, many people have deferred their mortgage repayments with mortgage relief measures coming in to last till the end of 2020, okay? So this is kind of to help minimize the impact um, that uh, COVID has uh, in the market itself, okay? And if you take a look, it also shows that the drop is expected to be uh, rather gentle, okay, mild, uh, given the packages that have been implemented by the government. As a result, homeowners would not be anxious to liquidate their assets at a lower price as the packages will type them, uh, most of them over this crisis. So I think this statement is quite important because um, we really only start to see, uh, you know, uh, a realized price drop when transactions are starting to come in at lower than normal prices. But as you see here, um, there is a lot of uh, st stability as well as resilience uh, in this aspect, okay? Uh, another interesting quote was that buyers will grab, okay, if prices drop 5 to 8% from banks' valuation. So this also means to say that if buyers see a drop of 5 to 8%, they will feel that they should rush in to buy and, and, and grab because it's a good deal for them. Okay, so from this article, it shows that um, although we are expecting perhaps, you know, um, distress sales, we're expecting maybe some people are looking at perhaps there will be a sharp uh, price uh, adjustment but that is not exactly what we're seeing in the market as of right now, okay? So in other words, the impact of COVID-19 uh, is seeing quite a mild impact on the property prices as of now. Okay, I would like to go into this um, LUV, 
trajectory. Um, people have been talking about, uh, you know, how is the curve going to be like? How is the recovery going to be like? And this is a summary by UOB that I think is quite clear. Okay, so there is some predictions and forecasts that different analysts have, and uh, one being that uh, there will be a V-shaped uh, recovery. Okay, for the economic recovery, um, V-shaped meaning there's a very sharp. Um, recovery, okay. Uh, they don't foresee this being likely with just a 20% uh, probability. They are looking at um, forecasting this scenario if there is containment of COVID-19 by the end of this year, okay, we're, uh, by the end of uh, the second quarter, okay, we're already to the second quarter and one half months to go, okay. I myself think uh, perhaps a little bit more unlikely, okay, for this scenario. Got chance, but perhaps more unlikely. Okay, so in terms of the global economy, it will be looking at a recession in the first half, a rebound in the second half, and growth still being positive, but lower than 2.9% uh, than what was achieved in 2019. Okay, and then we move on to the U-shaped. Okay, they do foresee this as being a very good chance of occurring, with a 5% probability, uh, containment being end of this year. Okay, this would see a sharp technical recession in the first half, recovery in the second half, but not strong enough. Okay, and global economy recording a full year contraction this year. Okay, um, maybe after I share the, the, the three scenarios, I will share my own take of where I think it could be. Okay, and then we move on to the L shape. This is more recessionary, it's the worst uh, scenario, and it means that containment may be only perhaps looking at sometime end of next year. Okay, there will be a deep recession for a full year, uh, demand destruction, prolonged financial stress environment. Okay, for myself, I'm quite hopeful, okay, I'm quite hopeful that it's actually in between the V and U shape, okay? Okay, so again, all these are predictions, all these are forecasts. I think um, it's good to see what analysts are, 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 are projecting, okay? And uh, this is another graph that's quite interesting. Okay, let's take a look at uh, Singapore itself. Okay, if you take a look at Singapore's GDP growth last year, it clocked in 0.7% GDP growth. Okay, that is uh, the, if you can see my cursor, that is the light, uh, light blue square over here. Okay, and the projected GDP growth this year, uh, they are actually looking at this blue bar, which is a negative 3.5. So if you look across the globe, you notice that um, they are forecasting most economies to have a negative GDP growth, okay? And the next year, they are looking at a forecasted GDP growth for Singapore of 3%. So what does this mean, okay? If they are projecting GDP growth of uh, 3%, which is a positive growth next year, which means that you're looking at a recovery, okay, in the next year. 2021. Okay, so then that determines the question of what type of window of opportunity are we looking at? Because all of us are thinking when will be the, uh, the low, okay, and then when will the rebound start, okay? So this is something that we should have in mind and I will be sharing a little bit more later to um, give some clarity, okay, on um, in the near, near term outlook. Okay, so I did have a prediction in the 2020s, pre-COVID, that was before COVID actually happened. Okay, so I'll share with you this, and then post-COVID, what was the change in this prediction? Okay, and I think this is quite important because we tend to focus uh, usually only on the here and now, and we sometimes forget, um, you know, on taking a broader based outlook, and uh, this helps to put things in perspective and give us more clarity and better planning uh, to look forward to what's going on ahead and from there make our decisions based on this, um, um, more informed decision based on this clarity, okay? So I'm actually looking through what's going to happen in the next 10 years, okay, from 2020 to 2030, okay? Um, I would say that we should be expecting the general election perhaps by end of this year. Uh, it happens every five years, so the latest it can be would be by perhaps second quarter of next year. Um, likely, I would think that it would be by end of this year. So based on this assumption, okay, I'm going to plot uh, and show you uh, during this 10 years timeline uh, what type of impact uh, and what type of market movements there may be. Okay, so I think 2020 has been quite exciting. In fact, at the start of this year, um, the stage one of our Thomson East Coast line actually uh, opened and operated, okay, the Woodland Stations, okay, and Thomson East Coast line stage two is looking to complete by end of this year, okay. Later on, I'll show you an article. In fact, more or less, you can see uh, it's already, already all up, okay. 
And next year, 2021, we're expecting the completion of stage three of the Thomson East Coast Line. This will be more of the city area where you have your uh, orchard stations, orchard uh, boulevard, your half block, your great world, okay, stations coming up. Okay, and all these are very major infrastructure developments that are ongoing, that are in plans to be completed very, very soon in the near, uh, near to midterm. Okay, okay um, government has released an article before saying that they will definitely increase GST to 9% uh, by 2025. However, I predict that um, they likely won't time it so close to the next election, uh, you know, you know, for their, okay, for certain reasons, because too close to general elections, they will be on people's mind. So I predict that it could be um, not so soon, perhaps in 2022, okay? Not so soon and not so close to the next GE, okay? Then we're looking at the East Coast Line Stage 4 to be completed in 2023, okay? This is more on the East, uh, towards the East Coast side, okay? 2024, I don't expect anything major, Okay, 2025, general election, and 2026. So we are now looking more at the mid to long term. Um, Singapore, is it going to open up to, for, to more foreigners? Okay, that's one thing which I will kind of uh, address a bit more later. And the Jurong Region Line Stage 1 will be complete and up by then. Okay, uh, this is interesting. Founders Memorial, the Thomson East Coastline, uh, Thomson East, uh, coastline station will be ready by then, okay? Um, the Jurong Region Line Stage 2 will also be completed and up. Okay, Founders Memorial is actually the marina, uh, current Marina Bay Golf Course. So it's something major that's going to happen as well. It's in the Marina Bay area, in a very prime location. So there's going to be a lot of growth and redevelopment and development plans uh, that is already reflected in the master plan itself, okay? Major, major growth note to be taken note of, okay? Then in 2028, is Singapore property market finally going to heat up? Okay, um, that's one question. Jurong Region Line Stage 3 will also be completed and up. And in 2029, would we be looking at a possibility of new measures if the market faces overheating? Okay, and um, of course the CRL, a CRL Stage 1 will also be completed. Okay, uh, in 2030, Okay, um, a few things to look out for. Okay, I think the population white paper predicted a target population of 6.5 million to 6.9 uh, million. Okay, this was uh, the target population. And this was also in order to achieve government's aim of maintaining a healthy GDP growth. Okay. I'll, share more, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Okay, um, I think there were also numerous articles predicting that the average PSF of um, Singapore housing in general would be looking at 2003 to 2009 per square foot. Okay, so this is interesting because there were a few write ups on this already predicting um, this uh, year on year increase of 5% of um, uh, more houses being averaging of 2 million. Okay, and these are articles by DBS and Morgan Stanley. Okay, so quite a few write ups on that. And also the Thomson East Coast Line station at Changi Airport Terminal 5 will be completed at this stage as well. So quite a lot of things happening in the, in the, in the, in the 10 years period and I thought I should take some time to share on this uh, because it will help us in looking, uh, giving clarity and also to making a more accurate prediction of what's going to happen uh, in the immediate term, okay? With this COVID happening and, uh, you know, timing, timing, uh, looking at when is the best timing, okay, to exit or enter. Okay, so my previous prediction was that property prices would remain low with little or no growth, perhaps, you know, in a marginal zero to one point something percent. Okay, many developers would be eager to sell and perhaps also cautious, okay, quite cautious of how market sentiments and, you know, in, their, in terms of their land bidding. Okay, government is still looking um, at limiting supply, still quite limited, I would say. Okay, and land costs likely should be maintained. Okay, with that. Okay, um... Next period, we're looking at the GST hike perhaps to happen in 2022. Okay, with that, developers' costs will already be impacted. It will already go up. Okay, it will affect construction costs. Um, and with Thomson East Coast Line up and creating positivity, okay, it may also affect land costs because that may mean, uh, you know, land costs may increase as well. And all these add on to developer costs, which then flows down to the selling cost of land. Okay, so with higher costs, property price growth, I should expect it to go up slightly to perhaps about 2 to 3%. And I tend to be a little bit more cautious here. 
Okay, some uh, analysts even predict uh, much higher, but I, I tend to be a bit more conservative in my predictions. Okay, the next stage would be with better infrastructure. Okay, with you, you can see with all the TEL lines up, um, that's massive infrastructure that is already being ready in place. Uh, you have more housing supply ready as well with more completed units. Um, I would predict the immigration policy to lighten at this point. Okay, number one, they have been keeping it quite tight. Okay, um, of course, because of all the protests, so on and so forth. Okay, but they, at some point or other, they have to lighten it. Okay, because Singapore, we are not a resource-rich country. We don't have much land. We don't have much commodities. Okay, we are heavily dependent on a very open economy and our human capital. So we really need this talent of GDP. And this was mentioned in the population paper. Okay, so... With that in mind, again, moving forward, prices may be pushed up by these foreign buyers coming in, okay, as well as local investors tapping on the rental demand created by this uh, pool of buyers. And as a result of the lightened immigration policy, property price growth may now be near 10% annually. Okay, may sound a lot, but it's still lower than the 15% annually that it saw in 2010 to 2013. Okay, so with all this in mind, um, a, bit, a bit of uh, you know, content to digest, but then we will ask, so when is the best time to buy? And my prediction pre-COVID was that right now would be the best time to buy because market being generally quite soft, okay, sentiments being generally quite cautious, uh, people are not really entering in at this point. So when people are not buying, that's the best time to buy, okay? Uh, and of course, a few more factors which I'll share later. Okay, then going forward, um, during this period, okay, would be a good time to buy. Okay, let me see over here in this period should be a good time to buy. Not the best, but still good, okay? Same for this period over here, 05 to, to, 25 to 27, okay? Finally, this last period, if you see my cursor over here, okay? Many will still buy. They will still buy, but they may have already missed the boat, okay? And this scenario happens very often, in fact, because just like the previous crisis, okay? Um, I will share a little bit more later why I say but uh, in, in other words, many will still buy, but would have already missed the boat. Okay, so that's the 10 years uh, timeline that I was sharing. And I think I would like to look in 2020 itself, this whole post-COVID. So what are we looking at? Okay, um, let's take a look. Now, I think all of us are looking forward to CV being lifted uh, first June, very soon. Okay, I hope nothing changes. And if you take a look at this period, it, was, it started in 7 April, okay, um, till date. Buyers are still buying properties, okay? In the month of April alone, 277 transactions, new sales took place. And if we minus the first week, okay, if we take sales from the 7th of April, that's when C, uh, Circuit Breaker started till date, uh, we have clocked in almost 100 units of project sales, okay? Which means with show flats not being open, um, we will only be able to done virtually, okay? Transactions only, be, only being able to be done the e-way, we are still having this very healthy volume. Of course, it's still impacted. Um, previous month, we were looking at 600 over units. This month, we, um, April, if we were looking at uh, close to 300 units. But I would, say still, I would say still encouraging, okay? Which means the underlying demand, the confidence in our economy and the long-term uh, outlook is still there, okay? So what happens when CB is lifted? Um, once CB is lifted, I think uh, the next thing on developers' mind would be that they may try to launch before the seventh month, okay, which happens on 19 August. Of course, sometimes um, based on past uh, history, even if they are launched in the seventh month itself, it's not an issue because buyers will still buy. But typically, uh, most people, you know, due to auspicious uh, date and all that, they would try to launch before the seventh month. Okay, so we would be looking at um, this happening. Okay, and... 9th August, I think this is when the nation celebrates. And with this, positive sentiments towards the nation's development should develop. Because that's the time when, if we um, look at when they hold the National Day Lab Rally, that usually is about one to two weeks after the National Day itself. And that is when um, the Prime Minister comes out to talk about going forward. Singapore's uh, long-term outlook, their plans for the future, what they have done and what we should be looking out for and the growth uh, that we could expect and be excited about. Okay, so there would generally be positive sentiments um, at this period. 
Okay. Uh, next of interest, I think, would be this um, Huangjing Shi Duan, uh, where Chinese buyers may be out buying on a buying street. We can see how once you release, it really, really becomes a tidal wave of uh, buying for them. Typically, they love to buy houses. Okay, So as we approach this uh, Huangjing Shi Duan, uh, which is their seven days, one week long holiday, their national day uh, celebrations, Okay, in the period of 1st to 7th October, something to take note of as well. Okay, And in relation to that, um, this article is a very recent article, okay, it was published 8 May, which means uh, just, just out. It states that Hong Kong has lost out on rich people's fresh funds to Singapore, okay, and most have overwhelmingly chosen Singapore to park their money, and as Asia's rich contemplate where to place their nest eggs, most have chosen Singapore, overwhelmingly so. Okay, so this would impact uh, the demand that we would be looking at coming into the market uh, at that period of time. Okay, so uh, quite a lot of things happening even in 2020 itself. Okay, uh, end of 2020, like I mentioned previously, we're looking for the TEL stage 2 to be completed. This would be really more good news. Uh, there will be more media uh, and press release and people would start to be interested in what's coming up around the new stations. Okay, so once the station is open, you realize that that causes uh, quite a lot of uh, buzz, activity, excitement, and of course that would also uh, flow down to the, uh, you know, the, the, the property values around that area looking to be pumped up by all this, okay? Okay, this uh, article shows you that almost 100 billion was earmarked for land transport projects, and over here you can see is actually a picture of the Bright Hills MRT, which is uh, stage two and also slated to be completed this year. So you can see it's already all up, more or less completed. In fact, to me, it looks almost ready to be open anytime. Okay. And by end of 2020, Okay, we should also be looking at the general election happening. This will really give a vote of confidence for the ruling party as well as the younger leaders that are stepping up. Okay, so really confidence in, uh, you know, uh, with, with this GE, confidence in the market, uh, they will be making, you know, very, um, identifying all the developments and plans that they will have, okay, and what is in place that they will have in mind for Singapore. So a lot of confidence on that. And in year 2021 next year, uh, TEL station stage 3 will be up. And I think I want to look into this. Um, developers replenishing their land bank and will that also have uh, see for us a new price level for land costs. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I think um, there has been quite a lot of talk about uh, when will the next on block fever start? Okay, you notice uh, in 2016 to 2018, that was when uh, a lot of developers came in to on block because if you look at uh, how to replenish land bank is only really through two ways, through government land sales, which means uh, you know, buying from government, uh, as well as from en bloc. Okay, and developers started to buy land in Trinfuville, Harborview Gardens, even below this, uh, even before uh, we hit this red line, which is um, you know, unsold units being below 20,000 mark. Okay, so what do I mean by that? We would be expecting that with government sales remaining low because of limited GLS. Okay, and taking an average sale of 9,000 units sold per year. Okay, if you look at this orange circle over here, okay, the unsold units should be less than 20,000 in 2021. Okay, even if we take this year, perhaps we may not hit 9,000, maybe less than that, maybe 4,000, 5,000. But even by the end of 2021, we'll be looking at units hitting another uh, uh, low of less than 20,000 unsold. Okay, and which means that the last en bloc cycle, which started 2016 to 2018, most developers would also have sold off uh, most of their units in 2021. So they may have to start replenishing their land bank, and in other words, it may start kickstart another cycle of buying at that point of time. So this is something interesting. Um, and if people were asking, you know, when will the next en bloc level uh, be, this might be something uh, to to analyze and. Uh, Look at, okay, 2022, okay, um, I would say there's a possible GST hike, okay, there would be money also available from the on block, possibly, okay, if based on the analysis just now we looked at, perhaps it's also a possible scenario, and then in 2023, Thompson East Coast Line Stage 4 would be up, okay, so uh, this is a little bit on the uh, near to midterm outlook that I would like to just highlight so that it gives some clarity for us going forward what's happening and I hope to clear some of the clouds um, 
you know, okay? And with that, I also come to my post-COVID uh, prediction. Uh, what is going to adjust here? Basically, I would say this part, okay? If you were to ask me when is the best time to buy, I would say, in fact, because of COVID and post-COVID, it's an even better to, time to buy right now. And I took my own advice, okay? Um, um, me and my husband, we just bought our assembly to rebuild uh, this period this period itself, um, during the COVID period, we bought it. And it's because I really have 100% confidence in the economic fundamentals of Singapore, as well as the resilience that our property faces and the value that it has, uh, even to uh, you know, the future outlook, the type of value that it can bring me. Okay, So uh, that is what I would like to share. And I really, really do want to emphasize that it is a very, very short window of opportunity is later so really don't don't miss the boat okay so with that um let me see okay quite on time uh so with that let me take a sip of tea okay i'll be touching on the top real estate mistakes you must avoid now that's uh, my main topic um and i think one of which uh in you know my decade long plus uh, uh years in this line, I think many of us in this line, we see a lot of people committing uh, the mistakes of not taking action and believing in myths. Um, of course, not everyone, definitely not everyone, um, but I just like to, like to share a bit about this and try to help decode some of these myths, okay? Okay. I hope you are enjoying uh, your tea time too, okay, uh, while listening in. Okay, so not taking action. I think um, a lot of people just choose to stay comfortable, are really, really comfortable where they are. It's not wrong, it's not wrong. Um, I'd just like to perhaps um, maybe open up, a, a, a open up a bit more opportunities of what you can look out for and perhaps maybe from there uh, influence you into maybe taking action, okay? Uh, so some maybe choose not to step out of the comfort zone, you know, um, just staying comfortable is one, okay? And also to procrastinate, okay? So what do I mean by that? Why, why delay? I'll talk about that later. Okay, some very, very, very common myths, okay, uh, until today, even my own family must tell me, don't buy 99, you must buy freehold, must buy, only can buy freehold, cannot buy anything else but freehold. Uh, don't get me wrong, I also love freehold, but I would like uh, to present some facts later to perhaps uh, decode this myth, okay. And then we also look into must buy resale, okay, resale is the best, okay. Uh, and also must buy new launch. New launch is really, you must buy new launch, okay? So why, okay? Let's take a look into these uh, topics. Okay, so to stay comfortable, I'm using this case study that I think is quite uh, common. I think we see this very often in our line. Okay, uh, this is actually a real case that I'm sharing. Um, okay, so Mr. and Mrs. Tan, not the real name of course, they got their BTO back in 2003. Okay, they were 40 years old and 35 years old back then. Okay, both of them were having stable jobs, good wages, okay, in the prime. Okay, they had two sons, uh, young, three and four years old. Okay, uh, when the estate received a cheap MOP five years later in 2008, the sons had just started to go to primary school. Uh, Mrs. Tan quit her job and became a full-time housewife. Okay, um, at this point, they did not think of selling. Okay, then in 2013, they realized that their flat could fetch over 100,000. Again, they didn't think of selling as their sons were having PSLE uh, and another just started secondary school. Okay, and then recently in 2018, they became interested to upgrade as their sons had grown up. Uh, they felt that a condo with nice facilities would be good for their active sons in terms of well-being, you know, lifestyle. And they were also thinking about what they can leave behind as a legacy for their children. Uh, at this point, they were already 55 years old and 50 years old. Okay, so this is a typical formation of a family, okay? Uh, this is what happens when the HDB reaches MOP. Okay, just before the HDB starts to age, and the next stage would be when you finally realize that you should act earlier. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Let's look a bit more into detail. I'm giving you the exact example, okay, um, just so that you can put things in perspective. Um, and again, I think um, your Hutton's agent will be able to share more with you, uh, uh, you know, uh, to share with you more price chance, and from there, maybe can look into what you could do. Okay, so for Mr. and Mrs. 
Mrs. Tan's blog, um, if they had upgraded in 2008, you can see here, okay, using the typical, uh, the average uh, 4,700 per square meter for the HDB in this estate, okay, they would have sold at 517K. Okay, if we use 16, uh, 600 per square foot and 1,250 square feet, I'm basically using the typical OCR uh, average per square foot as well as the typical size back then okay, to do a calculation of how much their new home would have cost if they had bought at this 2008 period. Okay? The cost of upgrade for them would have been $233 okay, based on this uh, difference of selling and buying. Okay? The cost of upgrade would have been 233 Okay, next we look at 200, uh, 2013, okay, using 7,500 per square meter average uh, selling price of their HDB block then, they could have sold at 825K, okay, and using a typical OCR per square foot of 1,000, and the sizes then already were starting to be more efficient, okay, I'm being very, very realistic, okay, um, instead of keeping it at 1,002, I'm now looking at maybe 1,100 square feet for a tree bedder. Okay, their new home would cost 1.1 million and the cost of upgrade would have increased okay, by 42k based on the previous cost of upgrade of 233k. Okay, uh, I hope you, you can uh, follow me thus far. Okay. Um, next, they only upgraded in 2018. So if we look at this uh, point of time, they sold at 6728 per square meters at a quantum of 740k. So the interesting thing to note was that they could have actually sold earlier, for example, even in 2008 or 2013. Okay, if they had sold in 2013, they would actually have uh, made more profit from the HDB at 825. Okay, but even at 740, they still make. Yeah, but if we look at um, using 1,250 per square foot for the average OCR at this point of time, for 1,000 square feet, now I made it even slightly more efficient. Okay, that's the type of three bedroom size that we're looking at. Their new home would have cost 1.25 million and the cost of upgrade, in fact, almost doubled. Okay, if you look over here, 510K, the cost of upgrade is now 277K more than if they had upgraded in 2008. Okay, so this is a very interesting case study um, and something to really think about. Um, is, it, is it really ideal to stay comfortable? There's nothing wrong with staying comfortable. Of course, really, it's all, all a personal choice. But would it be the best choice for you and your family? That's something to think about. Okay. Okay, um, next would be procrastinate. Okay, procrastinate meaning... You may have a desire, you may want to upgrade, you may want to have a better lifestyle, uh, you, want to, you may want to buy something right now. Okay, but when it is down to making a decision, you avoid, you avoid making that commitment. Okay, there are many reasons for that. Okay, largely is due to fear. Okay, fear of the unknown, scared of what will happen. Okay, my advice is with all the known information that you have, market is really very transparent now. Okay, there are many, many real estate professionals. Your husband's agent can really break it down for you and do many, many research and analysis to show you what is the best uh, decision to make based on a calculated risk. Really, trust me, make a firm decision. Um, my own personal experience when I uh, started to my own investment journey 10 years, more than 10 years ago, I could have hesitated. Lucky my husband more firm. Huh? Uh, so he really said, just go for this. You can't find the best. Okay, there are many, many buys. You just have to make a firm decision, buy, move on, go, and then, you know, uh, repeat, this, repeat this cycle. So you just have to really have the guts to make a firm decision, okay? Um, your own decision, okay? Your own calculated decision. Uh, no, don't need to listen to other people's decision because this is your decision. Okay, if you need to listen to the uh, advice from professionals, uh, that's my advice, uh, my own humble advice, okay? And also people are scared to lose. Okay, I think this is very common. Uh, I myself also fall into this, okay? Are prices going to fall any further? Okay, uh, we're constantly chasing the rock bottom. It's very common. We're constantly chasing, is it really the best? Uh, is it going to bottom out even more? You know, is it coming in at really, really the most rock? Okay, but proven time and time again, chances are that you will miss the rock bottom and in fact, the entire window of opportunity altogether if you don't act. Um, I actually know uh, a friend of mine, okay, uh, back in 09. Frankly, back in 09, you buy anything, you should make one. Uh, okay, but um, 
he went around looking at a lot of properties, you know, really looking to buy. Look, 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 look. And uh, never buy, okay? Because was kept, kept feeling that, you know, he really wanted to time it such that he will he would buy at the really, really rock, okay? And until today, still haven't buy. Still chasing that rock bottom, okay? So, uh, really, um, don't avoid, okay? When it comes down to it, make a firm decision. Okay, and a lot of times people also mistake a low with a high. Okay, so for people like him or maybe um, you know, uh, you know, it's not uncommon. Um, they are always caught in the trap of the past, thinking of prices ten years ago. Like oh, I I could have bought ten years ago. I missed it. Okay, today now prices are so high. I shouldn't buy lah. And then again, after they miss this round. 10 years later, they'll look back, ah yeah, I could have bought 10 years ago. Okay, so mistaking a low with a high is really something uh, uh, not uncommon. And um, I would like to highlight that this is a very common real estate mistake that I would like that we identify not okay, last year who have tuned in. Okay. No offense, ah, please. Uh, just sharing also um, 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 of what we uh, see and uh, hopefully it can help you in your real estate making a best decision. Okay, so now I'm actually going to uh, go into point by point, okay, the myths and try to share some statistics and decode these myths for you. Okay, so I would like to go into a bit of my own personal sharing uh, on why we must buy free home. Okay. Okay, so back in 2009, uh, that was the crisis period, okay, the, global financial crisis, my family actually felt that it was a good time uh, to make use of the crisis uh, to invest in the property, okay, because prices had adjusted very attractively. And after some fact-finding and analysis, um, uh, we suggested them to buy a three-bedroom at a 99 years leasehold new launch near the MRT in District 19. Okay, that was, uh, we, after doing all our research, we felt, we narrowed in and we felt that, you know, this is a very, very good top choice, okay, and we recommended them strongly to, to buy this. Okay, and back then, it was selling at an average of uh, 600 over per square foot. In fact, before the crisis kicked in, it was selling at 900 over dollars per square foot. So, it had already, uh, you know, adjusted. And so we felt it was very, very attractive to uh, come in. Uh, it's a very good value buy. Okay. However, my family was strongly advised by everyone, uh, their friends, their relatives, you know, you know, their Tai Chi friends, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people strongly advised them, don't buy uh, 99, okay? If you must go for the free home one, do not buy 99. So in the end, with all this, they were influenced that they, they, they Cannot, they must buy freehold. It's either that or nothing. So they bought a freehold uh, two bedroom new launch at D9, uh, walking distance to MRT, also a good location. At, uh, it, it had also had a good price of 1150 per square foot. Before the crisis, it was selling at 16XX per square foot. Okay, but uh, when we were doing our studies, we still felt that the first choice would have been better. Okay, so if it were you, which would you think would be the better choice? Okay, um, due to sensitivity, I actually blocked out the, the projects because uh, sensitive lah. Okay, but um, I will still share the actual facts um, uh, of this. Okay, so the 99 years, you can see both and the three hole, they both completed at the same time. Okay, uh, in fact, the 99 years saw a capital gain, if you see this uh, uh, box over here, of 3.4% per annum, whereas the freehold saw a capital gain of 0.7%. So that's almost five times more, okay? What type of profit would they have seen if they had, uh, you know, uh, uh, done otherwise? Okay, let's look at it. Uh. Okay, so from this graph, the three bit the quantum is generally the same. Okay, so uh, we could have bought a three bedroom larger unit uh, at a lower per square foot at eight hundred eleven thousand. That was at six fifty per square foot, one two four nine square feet. And in the end, due to all the influence they had, they went for the three whole two bedroom seven six four square feet instead at one one five zero per square foot. And so it was purchased at eight seven eight thousand six hundred. Okay, today. Okay, uh, haven't sold it yet. Okay, we could have sold it earlier. Okay, let's talk about today if they were choose to sell it. Okay, this three bedroom 99 years is estimated 1,003 per square foot. You can see over here. Okay, this is the 99 years uh, leasehold one. It's at 1,003. Uh, it would fetch 1.6 million. Okay, and the two bedroom freehold, which is uh, over here, you can see at 1,600 per square foot uh, 
price, market value, it would transact at 1.222 million. Okay, so what are the figures that we're looking at? If we were to sell today the unit that uh, my family has, it would make a profit of 450 per square foot. So there is still a gain, okay? And a profit of, in terms of quantum, 343,000, okay? How about the 99 years? The profit would have been $650 per square foot and a quantum of 811,000. In other words, more than double the profit. Okay, so I'd just like to share that um, um, there's nothing wrong with freehold, okay? I'd just like to say that if uh, it really depends on what you need, okay? If it is for stay, then by all means, go for something that you really feel comfortable, that you really love, you know. Um, but if it is for investment, then if, you, if, they, if they had opened up their options to 99 back then, would it have been a better choice for them? Okay, think about it. Okay, they would have had more than double the profit back then. Okay, so this is just something that I want to share, that it is really a myth. It is, not, um, it is certainly not a must, okay, that you must buy a freehold. Okay, that is just what I would like you to have a takeaway from today. Okay, uh, you can definitely, all good, there is a premium to it, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, forever yours, but uh, again, it is certainly not a must to have, okay? So it depends on your objective. Okay, so now I move on to, and I think uh, it's quite an interesting topic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, buyers usually all, you know, we always have a very interesting dialogue and debate on this, but your husband's agent will be able to share more with you on this topic and uh, really go and look into the price trends. Okay, I will also be looking into two more topics that I think are very interesting. Okay, um, another myth is that you must buy resale. Okay, it's, you must buy resale. Okay, it's much better than buying a new launch. Okay, or, um, Okay, let's look into this topic. Okay, I'm not sure if you all find this familiar. Coco Palms actually launched in 2014 as a new launch. It came into the market back then at an average of 1050 per square foot. Okay, some buyers opted to buy Livia, which is in the same location. Okay, uh, it's a resale, thinking that it's cheaper and bigger. Okay, so what do I mean? Okay, Livia resale at that point of time, uh, when Coco Palms was a new launch, was 925 per square foot at a quantum of 1164, okay, 1.1 over a million. Okay, that was for a three bedroom at 1259 square feet. Okay, so the new launch in comparison at that time, Coco Palms is a three bedroom, uh, slightly smaller in size, 1098 because of the efficiency, at a slightly higher per square foot, 1050, but at a lower quantum. So in fact, it was actually cheaper for a new launch, okay, at uh, the lower quantum. Okay, so where am I leading to? Okay, take a look at this graph. Okay, it is natural, okay, because all things new, it's, it's very natural for new launches to have a higher price per square feet, a uh, foot. Okay, of course, in fact, some new launches, if you look at it today, some may even be similar price as resale. That is when it is really, really good. Okay, that's a really, really, I would say, an undervalued, very good opportunity. Okay, um, speak more to your husband's agent about that. Okay, so in general, uh, resale usually reaches a stagnant price level. Okay, usually it stagnates, it plateaus, and then maybe it starts to see a downward trend. Okay, so if you take a look at this orange, uh, this orange line, that's Livia, you notice not only did it hit the stagnant price level, it's already starting to show a downward trend. Okay, so new launch on the other hand usually appreciates. Okay, why? If you look at Coco Palms, okay, you can see it appreciated from the time uh, it launched till now, $300 per square foot. Whereas Livia, from the time Coco Palms launched and people bought Livia, it actually transacted looking at a loss. Okay, so if you, if you notice, Livia is in fact now on a downward trend. Then I would like to just share this uh, interesting um, this fact. Okay, imagine that you were a buyer for Livia, you bought at uh, first hand from developer at $600 per square foot. Okay, and then you bought it second hand on the resale market uh, versus maybe, okay, buyer A bought first hand, buyer B bought second hand, uh, they bought at maybe $900, okay, at this point of time. You can see about $900 to maybe some over $1,000. If you were to sell, if you were the first buyer and you were to sell at $800, you would still make a profit. Okay, but if you were the buyer who buyer B who bought over here, you bought at 900 and you were to sell at 800, that's when you will be transacting at a loss. So in fact, it places, buyer B is placed at a, uh, a more disadvantage over buyer A. Okay, so that's something to, for you to digest. 
Okay, so then I'm going to move on to the next uh, myth, which is why uh, we, people always also say you must buy new launch. Okay, um, I would like to talk about it really objectively today. I'm just here not to push that you for you know for for a particular thing. Okay, or not to push for a particular project. I'm just here to objectively share, and from there you can really reevaluate on what is the best decision for you. Okay, uh, there's no ultimate right, no ultimate wrong. Okay, so again, all these are my personal opinions and I hope uh, it helps you in um, uh, reviewing on your next purchase. Okay, so in fact, if you ask me, not all new launches are good buys. Okay, uh, why? Sometimes, you know, uh, it may be priced very bullishly, okay, or it may also be due to weaker product attributes that may not uh, uphold its value as well. Okay, so if we look in uh, another two projects, okay, um, one resale uh, and one uh, a new launch, okay, again, due to sensitive, sensitivity, I uh, blanked it out, okay. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so the 99 year is actually a resale that completed in 2006 and the 2000 new launch completed in 2012. Okay, you notice the newer new launch actually trans has a negative capital gain versus the uh, other one that has a positive capital gain. So take a look at this graph. Okay, I've uh, put in so that it's uh, more comprehensive and easy for you to see. Let's uh, digest it a bit. Okay, so the orange line is actually the new launch. Okay, so if you had bought during launch time, okay, sometimes um, you may see launches that perhaps are that may be priced maybe above um, a fair market value okay so um, this was one such uh, launch okay they priced pretty bullishly okay and after launch you notice that instead of making it actually fell okay you can see from here to here it actually fell okay versus the 99 years leasehold that if they had bought during launch Okay, they actually saw an appreciation for eight years upon completion. So there was an appreciation okay, across a span of eight years. Okay, more or less, then it starts to stagnate, kind of plateaus out. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to share. Um, it's still important to assess the entry price. Okay, you, you still have to be selective. Okay, and that's where professional advice is really, really something that you should uh, look out for. You really have to be selective. You have to assess the entry price, look out for the right attributes also. Um, product attributes for new launches are also very important. Okay, and all this you really have to, there's a lot of, um, things in mind it's not just a one factor it's a whole a whole you know a whole package of factors that will determine uh, uh, how good it is to enter how how good it is and how easy it is for you to exit okay so this is something uh, i think i would like to share as well okay not necessarily that you must buy new launch but it also has to be selective okay so objectively speaking okay i would like to give some tips to assess the entry price and product attributes Okay, so entry price, I think, is determined by a few factors. And uh, one of them being the land cost, which is the, the fixed, okay, the fixed cost. Okay, and the estimated construction cost typically is about $350 per square foot. Okay, other miscellaneous costs, there's a lot because now even rebuilding my house, wow, it's really no joke, okay. Even at $400 per square foot, I may not even be able to get everything I, I want. And other costs add in is uh, your architect, architectural costs, architecture fee, okay, your uh, engineering fees, um, your GSTs, okay, uh, uh, over here would be like marketing and all this. Okay, so let's take that as 15% as an estimate. Again, this is just an estimate, just a guide for you, okay. Uh, the exact, uh, okay, that, that, that is a different matter, but based on this, it gives you a good guide. Okay, so um, A plus 15, so your break-even cost plus 15, that will give the estimated selling price. And from here, um, if we compare the actual selling price, that will give us an idea whether this is good or not to enter. Okay, so product attributes are also uh, something that uh, you should look into. Okay, um, location, scale of char and character of the product, the interior layouts, the view, and the developer. Okay, all this will determine uh, the type of value that this uh, development will have. Okay, again, if you're looking for stay, it's very subjective. It's really down to your preference. Okay, um, otherwise these are things that you should look into okay, when buying, especially for investment. 
Okay, so um, I'm taking this as an example, and uh, for those of you who recognize this image, this is actually Sterling Residences. Uh, um, the land cost for this was 1050 per square foot. Okay, so if we take the uh, average uh, 350 and we plus the 15%, we're looking at a break even of about 1600 plus per square foot, and the estimated selling price of 1850 per square foot. Okay, today it has already out of a thousand uh, units, it has already sold uh, a, a, a lot, okay. Um, I think left with the last 300, but we still many choice units. Okay, there are two bedrooms available right now. Uh, in fact, this is a level 20, okay. And I just want to share again, for estimated selling price, usually you're looking at perhaps the price or the PSF of a three bedroom. Okay, usually one bedrooms and two bedrooms, they usually do fetch a slightly higher per square foot for the smaller unit types. So for a two bedroom here, okay, a very, very high floor, 20th level, at 1817, which is below its estimated selling price, I would say this is a very good assessment of one such good buy in the market, okay? And product attributes wise, if you look at it, so we have touched on price, okay, location, okay, this one is just three minutes walk to Queenstown MRT, uh, you have a, a wet market, a lot of food centers nearby, okay? The scale of the development is big, so you have very, very well designed and very, very good full condo facilities. Okay, many pools within the development, uh, many communal spaces. There's very uh, unique characteristics about it. There are sky terraces in between. And all this, uh, why it's important, it determines, for example, if you're renting out, oh, you have more facilities for tenants to enjoy, uh, you know, um, so on and so forth, okay? And of course, buyers who buy for stay, they love the look of the development. It also helps to increase the demand for it. So all this also uh, determines uh, how strong a product is. Okay, then interior layouts, of course, uh, when we look at uh, layouts, we look at functionality, we look at efficiency, we look at um, a usage of space, you know, li very little wastage, uh, um, so on and so forth, okay? So for this very functional, very efficient layouts, okay? And then the views. I think this is something that majority of the units here have really good views, either towards Bukit Timah Hills or unblocked landed views. So this is something that this also has. And developers are also very important. And for this, uh, it's a very award-winning developer. Uh, it's by Nanshan and Logan. And they have a very, very good track record and uh, many projects that have been uh, out in the market already, established developers and award winning. So uh, these are the attributes that I would recommend you to check with uh, when you're making your uh, real estate purchase. Okay, and definitely these are things that can be assessed with your Hutton's agent because uh, we are all trained and specialized in looking out for all this and recommending accordingly to your preference. Okay, so um, I'm using uh, Sterling Residences here as an example. Of course, there are still many, many other good buyers around. Uh, do remember to check all these out with your Hutton's agent. Okay, I would say that uh, there are many, many good buys. Uh, don't miss it, but there is a there's a inventory that is really depleting. Okay, all these are existing stock in the market that sooner or later it will run out. Um, transacted all at old prices, you know, it's really good products selling out very soon. Okay, but there is still still units here that you uh, that you can buy at really good uh, prices. Okay, so with this, okay, I think I have covered. Uh, let me see my time. Okay, perfect. Um, more or less on time. Okay, so not taking into not taking action. Okay, I've covered um, basically just one thing to stay comfortable or you know uh, one thing to buy but delaying. Okay, take action. My advice is really take action. I really hope that you don't miss out. This is a very short window of opportunity, and when it rebounds, you really you you can't catch it. You can't catch up. Okay, it rebounds very sharply. So uh, take action. That's the most important thing I would like you all to have as a takeaway from today's uh, sharing session. Okay, and then um, myths, I hope I have decoded uh, that it is not necessarily that you must buy freehold. Okay, of course, we have many good freehold uh, products to recommend as well, but uh, it is not necessarily so that it is the best. Okay, so really do look into opening up your options 99. I'm really good. My own case, uh, I think the only freehold I bought is my landed. The rest of all my property purchases have been 99, okay? So just, just be open about that, okay? Um, okay, another one would be that you must buy resale. Um, resale is it's not that it's not good, but you really have to take note. Uh, when you buy resale, it is already of a certain age. So what type of exit are you looking at? Is it really going to be the best for you? Okay, again, really it really depends on yourself, okay? I'm not saying that 
cannot, but uh, these are just factors that you could look into. Again, uh, your Hutton's agent can better assess and recommend. Okay, and then finally, you must buy new launch. Okay, again, uh, I think uh, it is not always the case that it will uh, you will see capital gain from it. You really need to assess and be selective. Okay, in order to choose the best. Okay, so. Um, in summary, and a bit of my own personal advice, my own humble sharing, because I'm sure many of you out there may have uh, multiple and many, many uh, uh, properties yourself. Okay, uh, so just some of my own uh, sharing. Okay, so today I have already shared on the impact of COVID-19 on the economy and Singapore's property market. My personal prediction on the recovery timeline, uh, as well as how property prices uh, may be in 2020. Okay, and top real estate mistakes that you must avoid. Okay, so finally, I will end off with um, my own humble advice. Start young or start now. Okay, it's never too late to start. It's really never too late. Um, but you really have to just know you have to take action. Uh, uh, some, uh, you know that saying. Okay, start young. I started in 25, uh, 26. Today, I'm 36. Okay, still going to continue on uh, um, this, this way to leverage on Singapore property. Okay, so that's my own advice. Um, leverage on Singapore property to grow your wealth and really end of the day seek professional advice to help you make the best real estate decisions. Um, sometimes uh, you know, but look for the professionals, okay? Uh, really all of us here today, uh, we just want to have the best, your best interest at heart and I think there are many many tools and many many uh, price trends, property trends that your Hutton's agent, please look back for Hutton's agent, can really share with you. And anything that you may have, um, I'll be looking into some of the questions later. I may not be able to answer all. Uh, please look back for Hutton's agent. Uh, they will definitely uh, answer you, uh, you know, uh, with the best content and information that you may require. Okay? So, thank you, thank you very, very much for attending today's session and um, really appreciate the time uh, on your Saturday afternoon to, to tune in to my session and a very big thank you and I hope you have enjoyed and benefited from this session okay uh, PK over to you and thank you very much everybody right thank you Alisa for your insightful presentation uh, you know reflecting on what Alisa mentioned about the case study just now you know I personally feel that sometimes uh, the excuses that we have used to prevent us from asset restructuring all these years could be the same exact time bombs that we plant to haunt us a few years down the road, isn't it? All right, I'm sure that many of us have gained a lot from the information that she, she just shared. And regardless of whether you're a seasoned investor or you know maybe someone who is just starting out on your first home purchase, 